So, hello, uh, good afternoon. So, uh, uh, welcome to the Institute of Physics uh, Northeast uh, uh, Branch Lecture Series. So, I'm uh, Sergio uh, Gonzalez Sanchez, committee member in the Northeast Branch. Uh, we have, well, I'm going to switch on the camera as well. Yes, much better. So, uh, uh, we are looking forward to, uh, to our uh, lecture uh, this evening on different ways of seeing uh, light with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Almut Bays. So, also we have a few people uh, behind the scenes. We have uh, Bethany uh, Wotton and also uh, Paul uh, Williams. Uh, this event is on, on uh, GoToWebinar, so uh, your audio and video will not be visible, so there will not be any, any issue. Also, if you have any question, uh, just type it in the question and answer box. Uh, I hope you can see this. Uh, so uh, I will try to uh, get them uh, at the end of the of the of the talk. So now uh, we're going to do a, a little test now. So it would be great uh, if uh, you could type uh, uh, in your uh, in the question and answer box uh, who you are and where are you joining us from. Okay. Uh, it would be great if you can type in the question and answer box to make sure it works. Do you want me to type something or, or anyone? Uh, no, it's uh, that, that attendees. I can see uh, 29 attendees. If uh, any of the attendees could type something in the question and answer box to make sure it works. Hello, Robin. Okay, Robin from Dorset. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alice from Newcastle. John Thorley from Darlington. Hi, welcome. Okay, okay, so it works. Okay, th th thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, uh, finally, uh, well, just to let you know that uh, uh, this lecture is being recorded uh, and uh, will be uploaded in, in the uh, IOP Radio Sanations uh, YouTube uh, channel, and well, uh, so that you can enjoy all of it uh, in the, the the future. So, well, it's my my pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, speaker for for this uh, evening, uh, Professor uh, Almut Beis. Uh, she's Associate Professor for Quantum Optics and Quantum uh, Information at the University uh, of Leeds. Uh, she's a uh, head of the of the theoretical uh, physics uh, group. And well, now I don't want you to make you wait more time. So I will now hand over to Professor uh, Bayes. Mm -hmm. Please, whatever you want, you can start. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Sergio. Thanks for uh, introducing me. And uh, yeah, hi to everyone from uh, for, for joining me tonight. Uh, please uh, put questions in the chat anytime. Uh, I, I will try to keep an eye on it and, and uh, it's always nicer to give a talk with a little bit of feedback. I always encourage students in sessions uh, and first years, even if they just say hi, <laughs> it, uh, it, it makes it more lively and then if everyone's going very quiet, I, I know it, uh, I'm talking too fast or doing something wrong. Um, yeah, so, so uh, like said, you said, and thanks to Bethany also for setting everything up. And there are always some hiccups at the beginning with some something with the technology has to go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's start. I hope you can all see my screen. And um, yeah, the topic of the talk is different ways of uh, seeing light. Yeah. So and uh, like said, you said, I'm from the University of Leeds. Uh, the talk will have three main talks and then I have some final remarks at the end. And in the first part, we will talk about classical ways of seeing light. Uh, light is interesting for many reasons and, and, uh, and I hope um, you get a bit of an idea of how scientists approach topics and how we look at things uh, by looking at light as a nice example. Um, if you ask a child what is light, I, I think when I, when I prepared the talk, I, I had uh, I looked around a lot also on YouTube uh, and I found some nice videos where uh, some reporters were asking people, uh, what do you think, what is light? And uh, it was quite interesting because there were so many different answers. It's not really uh, an easy answer to question, uh, an e easy question to answer, sorry. Maybe try for a second to think about how you would define light. If you want to put it in the chat, you're very welcome. Um, if you ask a child, for example, then the experience that many children have, they probably think of, think of light as rays. And uh, our first pictures of light, our first models of light and our under initial understanding of light was to see 
light as rays. Yeah. Um, initially, because uh, this really looks like this is some particles that are coming down from the sun, and uh, for example, and they travel up, traveling in a straight line. So uh, Newton, for example, so initially Descartes, and then in 18, uh, sorry, in 1637, he thought of light as particles. At the time, people were reading a lot of, uh, they were learning Greek and they were read, reading all Greek uh, books and, and whatever was uh, saved. Um, so, so, of course, uh, Aristoteles and, and other people introduced a thought about light before. So he picked up on this idea of light being corporal skills and Newton also promoted this idea a lot. And um, if you think of, if you make a hole in the in the wall and you let sunlight come through, it's very natural to think of uh, light as something that is made out of particles. Yeah. And uh, one other thing that Newton uh, introduced was, for example, he he uh, looked at prisms. So uh, what he distinguished was different types of light. Yeah. So you could, uh, when you have sunlight coming in, for example, through a little hole hitting a prism, then uh, every every color of the light is is diffracted differently, and then you can see that there are many different colors of light um, that you could have. And then uh, another quantity that how we describe light is by polarization. And the color we know now that that is actually the, the frequency of the light that uh, that creates the color. And uh, having this very simple understanding of light as rays and uh, as thinking of it as particle. It's already enough to build quite a lot of uh, things. For example, that's all you need in order to geo do geometrical optics. So it's enough to design, for example, how a microscope works. I won't go uh, too much into detail on how things work because uh, I want to tell you a bit more stories behind and a few stories that you're probably maybe less familiar with by, uh, so not the, Oh, I, I won't want, uh, want to repeat a, a school lecture, um, but the important point here is that just thinking of having the simple model of light as rays is everything you need to design telescopes, microscopes, and so on. And uh, uh, telescopes or microscopes, their design and how they look like hasn't changed very much since they were first introduced. So, but, uh, but of course, if uh, if you think about it, if you have looked into it a little bit more, um, if you are a, a physicist or you're having, uh, or at school, you will have heard that light is not just rays, it is also uh, waves. And uh, a more accurate description of light is, is to describe it as waves. Yeah, and, and, and the color that we're actually seeing is the different frequency that we associate with different light so so the um so what we are thinking of what physicists think of it when they think about waves what opticians think about when they think about light they think about waves which are exactly the same waves as what you see in nature when you stand on the beach and the water is going up and down uh in in this way but how do we know uh, that light is waves because that looks completely different than the kind of experience that we have of light uh, and, and it seems like a completely different model and uh, the, the a way of demonstrating that light is actually made out of waves and not just out of rays and particles that travel in a straight line was an experiment uh, that Thomas Young uh, in, introduced or presented to the Royal Society in 1806 what he did is so the idea that that light might be waves goes back to Christian Huygens in 1678, so quite a long time ago, uh, but people didn't really believe him. He looked a lot at diffraction, but um, this corpuscular theory of Newton was uh, just working well and, and um, they, they didn't have a, a reason to think of anything else. Well, what Thomas Young did is he, he put two slits, yeah, two little holes into uh, in the videos I was describing earlier from YouTube, uh, someone did uh, the experiment at the beach in Australia. They took a bit, big cardboard, bo cardboard box and put two little holes 
in there so that where the sunlight would go in. So let's say you have light coming in from somewhere, it's going through holes, and if light were rays, then what you would expect is that the light would travel uh, from the hole to a far away screen and you would see two spots. Yes, yeah, so you would just see one spot and another spot. But uh, if you have light of one frequency, what you're seeing is you're seeing uh, different uh, contributions. You see not only one spot, so, but you see many, many light and dark spots. If you do it with sunlight, then these spots look a little bit different. But the important thing is you don't see two dots. You really see more than two dots. And uh, suddenly you have a, a suddenly this theory of uh, light being some particles that travel on a straight line doesn't seem to work anymore. Yeah. Uh, because then we would not be able to explain these kind of patterns. Of course, if you make these holes very large, so if you make them really much larger than the wavelengths of the light, um, then you see, uh, then you just see light and shadow, and you will see just uh, your ray picture would be very accurate. But if you make the slots, the slits very small and not too far from each other, then you see this uh, extra spots appearing. Yeah. So this puzzled people a lot, but. Uh, and in, but it, this, by doing this experiment and showing it to people, um, Thomas Young convinced people that light was actually made out of waves. I mean, now we use electrodynamics to model light. We have uh, made quite a lot of discoveries. People uh, found different materials, sometimes inspired by biological systems. So we have a better understanding of light and waves. And having uh, materials with negative refractive index, we can use this kind of theory of light to construct much more complex models, uh, much more complex devices. So instead of building lenses that are quite big and uh, like in the microscope that I was showing earlier, yeah, so, so, so this is quite a big device uh, and it has this, this kind of lens in there, you can now build, having a better understanding, of what light is in terms of waves, you can build super lenses that can be very, very thin and uh, can have, uh, can also, uh, you can look at things much more clearly than uh, when you have a normal mi microscope. Or you can build devices that kind of bend the light. So, so this is a picture of an invisibility cloak. Um, so you, so someone is holding their hand behind the lens, but actually what you see when you look through it is you don't see the hand. All the light that's coming from the from the uh, hand, which is kind of close to this device, is bent away and guided to go somewhere else. So you only see the light that's coming from far behind the hand. And uh, so the hand has to become invisible. And it's really worth to go to YouTube or to different web pages and to look for images of invisibility cloaks. They are very impressive. Uh, I was quite impressed of what people uh, can do now. Some of my students went to a conference at the Royal Society a few years back and they were really impressed and it looks like magic uh, seeing this kind of device uh, working. Yeah? So the better, we, so what I'm trying to say is the better we understand things, the easier it becomes to design new applications and new devices uh, and to uh, yeah, make make new things uh, that go beyond uh, uh, what we can do with geometrical optics. Um, depending on what your background is, you probably know that light is waves not only in classical physics but also at the quantum level, uh, for example. So the, the, this kind of double slits experiments that we have seen that you could do with a big cardboard box at the beach in Australia <laughs> or anywhere you wanted to. You can do it. Uh, you only need, uh, uh, yeah, you only need the box. Um, so what? Um, so this kind of experiments, people also have done it. For example, where they have replaced uh, the slits by two atoms. They are excited with laser light, and then they look at the photons that are emitted. And this is exactly what is shown here. So this is a picture of an experiment that was done in 1993, where people, people had trapped two ions in an ion trap. They kept them, uh, they cooled them, they got them to almost zero temperature, 
they kept them at a very fixed distance because of the Coulomb repulsion. Yeah, so they, they built a trap and then the, uh, they had also the Coulomb repulsion between the two ions. They kept them at a fixed distance. And then they looked at the light that was coming out. And what they saw was that light was waves and particles at the same time. So, so if, you, uh, if you wait for a short time, you will see single spots arriving on the screen. And the long, but the longer you wait, you will see that there is also a pattern forming. So on the quantum level, so if we look even more closely into what light is like, then we see that uh, light is as well waves as well as particles. And, and, and that's something that is very hard to uh, get together, to kind of get your head around that uh, light can be two things at the same time. But again, it also depends on uh, in what context you are looking at it. In, in some experiments, you see the wave character more strongly. In other experiments, you see the particle character uh, much more strongly. Yeah. So what what, uh, what I did in this uh, first 15 minutes of the talk is I introduced already uh, quite a lot of different models uh, of looking at exactly the same thing. So everything we looked at was light. Yeah? So we, we started by looking at geometrical optics and uh, that was, <coughs> sorry, that was a very accurate model of, um, of light coming through a, a bigger hole. Uh, and then when we send light through very small holes, we see that it's actually waves. And uh, later on, we will talk about Maxwell, for example, we will see that there is classical electrodynamics, um, which is a quite different theory. So, so it, it uh, is, allows for light being waves in certain conditions. Sometimes you have but it also gives you more information, for example, how light interacts with matter, uh, how it behaves in, when there are charges and currents present. And then we have quantum electrodynamics, which is another theory that also describes light, but it describes light when we do experiments where, where we experiment with single photons, so we have light uh, that has is so thin that you can see like in this experiment before, you might see a single click forming on the photographic plate. Yeah, so you, if you do this experiment for a very short time, you might only see some uh, dots on the photographic plate and only after collecting light for a longer time, you see the full pattern emerging. So you, you can see that you have uh, at the quantum level you have, or when it comes to interactions between light, the single atoms, a uh, whole other level of complexity uh, comes in. And what scientists are doing is, uh, as scientists, we are kind of trying to look for the theories that go lower and lower down. So we are looking for the most complex theory that lets us describe everything in one go. Yeah. So. Uh, it's not wrong to say that light, for example, is waves, um, or it is not wrong to say that light is waves, sorry, or waves or particles, or uh, all of these theories are correct. Uh, but what's the difference be between them is their complexity. For example, I could use a, a full wave description, but when I uh, make the hole that the light comes through big enough, then you won't see any of the wave characters. And then it's a more modern, more easy, simpler model of uh, describing light as wave. So it depends on what kind of your context you're looking at light. But it's also that uh, the complexities of these series uh, becomes more and more complex. So we know that when we make, a, when we describe light as waves and we make certain approximations, then uh, like, like we look at devices that are quite big compared to the wavelengths of the waves that we are looking at, then the system will just behave like uh, geometrical optics. Yeah, in a similar way, when you look at the waves on the, on of a, on a lake, you, and you throw some stones, and you will see that a wave pattern forms. But if you are look at looking at the river, uh, on the river there might be waves, but depending on uh, how closely you look at it, you can also see it as just a stream and things that travel, uh, not as waves, but as just rays and particles. Yeah, so, so you have to be, and um, 
uh, what I mean by complexity going up is that in principle we could describe any scenario, for example, with quantum electrodynamics, which might be a bit complicated, um, but all the we, it's a theory that kind of uh, describes everything. And if we make the right approximations, then we 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 can derive. So we can, for example, we can derive classical electrodynamics from quantum electrodynamics. But what is important is we cannot derive quantum electrodynamics from classical electrodynamics because quantum electrodynamics is a more complex theory and uh, we only get from, from quantum to classical by doing simplifications and throwing approximations away. And what scientists are doing is we are trying to look for these more complex theories uh, while we are only knowing the much simpler ones. Yeah, So we are looking for more underlying complex theories that describe larger a wider set of systems uh, and it's it's a bit like <laughs> being Sherlock Holmes or trying to solve puzzles it's a it's a, 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 a normally a very hard task and the only reason why we even have a chance of succeeding is that uh, physics seems to have a lot of things in common yeah so um one of, I very much like this citation that uh, Leibniz put. I'm, I'm not a religious person, but I think at the time in 1686, uh, when you were paid by the king, you had to put uh, things in the right context. Um, so, um, so what, what Leibniz more or less says is that the world is kind of perfect. It has. It is at the same time something that is governed by very simple principles, which is what we are trying to find when we are doing research. We are trying to find these very simple underlying principles. And often what you find is that by going from one theory to the other, even if the theory becomes more complex, the equations and, and uh, the theory itself becomes simpler. But then these simple theories, they are often describing very rich phenomena. So when you look around the, the world, uh, just looking at the world, it's very hard to even find the definition of what light is because it can come in so many different shades and so many different uh, forms and in so many different, yeah, in so many different contexts. So finding the underlying things, what keeps everything together is not always easy. If I'm going too fast, or uh, feel free to put a, a question in the chat uh, anytime. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to uh, talk about in the second part of the talk is I want to have a closer look of uh, how we describe light in quantum physics and uh, where the ideas that we have uh, come from. Yeah. And um, yeah. But if there are any questions, just uh, I've put something in the chat. So uh, now we have seen that uh, if, that there are many ways of describing light. Let's have a closer look at the quantum ways of looking at things. And uh, it all goes back to uh, the beginning of the 19 of, of 1900. Um, what people discovered then, or, or the feeling that people in generally had, is the idea was that physics is already something that is very well understood. There may be one or two phenomena that people are not very familiar with, that they don't know so much about. And, uh, and, a, and an example that seemed to not fit in so well was, uh, and people didn't really know how to describe, was black body radiation. So what this picture shows you, it is a lava flow. And um, what people observed is that you can, so if the lava, so that comes out of an active volcano. If it is very hot, if it's around 1000 uh, degrees Celsius or 1200 degrees Celsius, then uh, you can deduce from the temperature, you can see how hot the lava actually is. So you can see the yellow patches, these are places where the lava is hotter than in places where you don't see any light coming out. The orange pieces are already a bit cooler so you can you get an idea yeah just from the temperature uh, and and this was a phenomena uh, which you can observe in nature and uh, 
what people did at the time is they did measurements. They measured what is the wavelengths. So what's the typical wavelengths or frequency of the uh, of the waves, and uh, how much you see uh, when something has a certain temperature. For example, if you have a have something that is uh, at 7,000 Kelvin, which is more or less 7,000 uh, degrees Celsius, then you mainly see uh, ultraviolet, yes, or you see violet light. When you, something is more at 5,000 Kelvin, then it's more, mainly more yellow, greenish. So you can uh, just see, looking at the temp, at the, at the light, um, yeah, then you can, uh, so, so they had uh, sophisticated, in 1900, they had sophisticated enough uh, measurement devices to measure this kind of curve and behavior and then to, if they would measure the temperature of the lava with a different temperature, with a different way of measuring temperatures, they would get very similar uh, results. And, um, but the problem they had is that nobody could calculate with these, this curve. They could put a fit through it, but they couldn't really explain where where this comes from, and, and even putting the fit through it was a difficult problem of the at the time. So what? Uh, so Planck came along, along Max Planck, and uh, he had been working on thermodynamics. So he was uh, very used to looking at things from a point of view where he said, "How many ways can I combine? In how many different ways can I combine it?" and then uh, doing some thermodynamic, using thermodynamical ideas, he could uh, do, and using thermodynamics, he could do a lot of predictions, but with, he didn't know how to apply these ideas that worked well with particles, how to use these ideas with light. So in order to use the concepts that he was familiar with from thermodynamics, what he did is he said that maybe what I need to do is I assume that the light, the waves that we have, that are made out of little energy uh, energy packages, and, uh, and every energy package has uh, uh, an energy h bar omega, where omega is the frequency, and if I then count how many of these packages I have, and how in how many different ways I can arrange them, then that tells me how likely a certain configuration is and then he suddenly managed to to uh, make a prediction for these curves at the time uh, so what what he kind of introduced was the idea that light which is waves is also at the same time made out of particles with a fixed amount of energy which is quite amazing because at the time uh, so so inadvertently uh, max planck in this way he opened uh, he really laid the foundations of what we needed in order to derive completely new physical theories and, and start started. Uh, and this is really where quantum physics started. And, and many people uh, give him credit for that. He later got the Nobel Prize. But what is interesting to keep in mind is that at the time, he didn't even believe in atoms. Yeah? So he invented the photon without even believing in atoms. But I guess uh, having a successful, being the father of a successful theory, he later on believed that this theory was uh, a good one and worked well. Okay. Um, what really made the, who really made the, the idea of that light is made out of particles, who made that, um, who, who made that interesting, or who made that concept and this idea po popular was, uh, was Einstein. So Einstein, uh, and at school, we, we all learned a lot about the photoelectric effect. So that it's part of the curriculum in, um, in every physics course. We spend quite a lot of time learning about the photoelectric effect. And, uh, and uh, that, that really is, yeah, so Einstein's photoelectric effect equation played an enormous part in the development of modern quantum theory. Uh, so he, he really is the one who introduced the concept of light quanta. But uh, what was shown, for example, later on is was in principle that that was a mistake uh, where something actually had gone wrong because 
the idea uh, that light is, or the experiments, like the experiments like the photoelectric effect, what people found later and what quantum opticians now know quite well, is that uh, we could also explain the photoelectric effect and the light you see out, you see coming out when you uh, excite things with laser light. Uh, you can also explain that without ever assuming that the light is made out of photons, all you have to do is to introduce that your the surface where you put the uh, light on is made out of atoms. Yeah. Uh, so Planck needed the concept of photons because he didn't have the concept of atoms. Um, but uh, it doesn't really matter. The important thing was it has happened. People uh, got the idea of light being made out of being waves and particles at the same time. It was popular, and then later on, someone invented the word photon. It, it wasn't Einstein, it, was, it happened a little bit later on. Um, and, uh, but yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes people get famous for something that's wrong. Sometimes they're famous that, uh, for something that's right, or uh, not famous for something that was right. Um, it, it's a lot of accidents, uh, but, but once we get to new knowledge, then uh, once we have new theories, we usually know that they are working and that they are right. Um, and they become established. Still, when you ask physicists, uh, even asking physicists, probably there are still different definitions of what a photon is. Um, de depending on who you ask, you might get slightly different answers. Um, but I think what most people think of as a photon is something is a photon is something that is made by an atom and uh, a photon would be the light that is emitted when a, a single atom that was in an excited state uh, goes down, emits light and goes into its ground state. Yeah? And if you think of a single atom, this let's say an excited state initially, it goes in its ground state, then uh, this atom couples more strongly if, if the energy difference is uh, between the two levels is h bar omega, then the atom couples more strongly to photon modes that have this frequency omega. And because of energy conservation, all the energy that was initially in the atom is afterwards in the wave packet that came out. Uh, that, that's why that tells us that, that a um, photon of frequency omega has to have the energy H4 omega. Yeah, so we have uh, in a nice way. And if you, for example, you trap, if someone traps a single ion and puts it in a, with a laser field in an excited state, uh, you can measure, it takes a certain amount of time for a photon to come out. And the photons that are created by, uh, by uh, an excited ion, for example, they easily are, they are about they are like, uh, because of the, we know the time it takes to come out. So a photon that comes from an ion is about one, one meter long. Yeah. Um, so more or less a photon is really a monochromatic wave uh, that travels in a certain direction. Or it could be a, a radial wave that travels in different directions uh, away from the source. Yeah. When you have, uh, when you create uh, photons in other ways, for example, by putting an atom between two mirrors, then the light bounces around uh, between the mirrors and it takes longer to get out. Then you create photons. If you create them more slowly, uh, you create photons that are much longer. Um, so in, in recent years, we have done a lot of progress in building single photon sources. Uh, the easiest way of creating a single photon is really to take uh, a single atom, but this single atom also could be an artificial atom. So anything that kind of traps uh, an electron either in a low energy or a high energy state. And uh, then you can put some later so that you can, you can prepare the initial state, uh, for example, with laser pulse, and then this will emit a photon and depending on when you put this laser pulse to excite your artificial atom or real atom, depending on what, what people are using, you really get one single photon, has a certain length. And then what you can do is you can send this 
a photon into a, so a beam splitter. Yeah, do, you can do different optical devices. Uh, you can store information in these atoms uh, in, and in these photons and send them to uh, different beam splitters. And then uh, at the end, uh, you can also detect uh, a single photon by doing exactly the opposite of what the single photon source does. Instead of having a single photon source, you have a single photon detector where uh, you have a two-level system sitting there and then you're probing if a, a light pulse has arrived there and you, you translate that somehow into a, a, a signal. So there is a, there is so much material on how we can play with single photons and what kind of experiments we can do. So um, I think it's quite, if, if, you, if you're interested, really uh, just Google pot single photon experiments in, in YouTube. So you see beautiful videos of how light is passing through these beam splitters, how it interferes, uh, and then how you can detect uh, photons here at the end. And by uh, designing these kind of networks in, in an interesting way, we have all the building blocks that you need to build uh, quantum computers, to build uh, quantum communication devices, uh, and so on. Um, so in, in the recent years, uh, we have seen quite a lot of creation, the creation of many new startup companies, also in the in very many of them in the UK. Some of them are more looking at short-term applications, some at more long-term applications. There are companies out there now who, who aim at, who are not yet building quantum computers. Uh, some are selling some already, but it, it not in the same way as we sell lap, as other companies sell laptops. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, interesting news uh, around all the time. What surprised me most is that recently I found out that there even is a LinkedIn already for uh, for quantum companies, startup companies. It is called OneQuantum.org. It's a web page that. Uh, where people who work in the quantum technology industry can subscribe. Uh, there is a one quantum Africa, a one quantum women. There are different groups who come together, support each other, similar as LinkedIn is uh, doing it for in, in other companies. You can have, uh, they organize conferences, they organize meetings. But not for the academics. Uh, it's not for people working in, in academia and in industry, uh, sorry, in universities, but for people who are at actually setting up startup companies to share resources, to uh, talk to politicians. And, and it's quite uh, amazing because we, we organized a big conference on quantum technology here in Leeds in, in about five years ago. And it was very hard to find companies that would come along and show their products uh, and that were interested in quantum technology. But now uh, it has changed quite a lot and it has. Uh, so if you're interested in this topic and what you can do with quantum technology, I, I really recommend to uh, check out this web page. Um, like I said, the talk, uh, my talk is made up of three parts. So the next part, I want to talk a little bit about uh, local descriptions of light. So, so, I've, so now we have looked at quite a lot of things that are already well established, uh, but I want you to think a little bit more about uh, light. Uh, and uh, what, what we in Leeds here find quite fascinating at the moment is to look at local descriptions of light. So as I promised earlier, uh, let's have a look at Maxwell. He was an absolutely brilliant uh, scientist and I, I agree with the biographer who wrote a biography for about him recently to say that we often we take a lot of what he did for granted uh, but um, reading his bio biography it really reads like the biography of a very modern scientist like really it could be one of your uh, colleagues they are talking about so it's it's um, it doesn't read like an ancient uh, book at all. Maybe it's the way it is written. But he has done uh, quite amazing things. And the way he approached problems, 
uh, was uh, quite impressive. For example, one of the things he did is he looked at light for many, many years. And uh, of course, he knew uh, a lot of the experiments and um, he mainly tried to use his intuition. Uh, he was uh, living on a farm. So his ideas about how water travels through pipes, uh, he used a lot of this kind of his understanding of something that uh, that he was more familiar with in order to construct quite elaborate theories of light and to get a good grasp of all this, what I mentioned before, is a very rich phenomena to come get down to the underlying more simple uh, principles that are behind. And then at a later time in his life, what he more or less did is he threw a lot of his uh, previous series away and made a completely new start. And what he did is he wrote down a very elegant set of equations, which we are now know as Maxwell's equations, which are equations for local electric and magnetic field amplitudes. And uh, when you are a physics student, uh, some of you might be or might consider studying physics, uh, it's um, we spend our students they spend a whole lecture course just on trying to get to grips with these four equations. So it's a course where you feel like you haven't understood. You haven't learned a lot because at the end you can summarize everything in four equations, but really understanding the whole, all the implications of, of these very few equations. I chose a, a simple set. So here we are. So these are Maxwell's equations when we don't have any uh, currents or any charges present. So, uh, so this is, these are Maxwell's equations. They look a little bit more complex uh, in the more general case. Uh, but we're here interested in light and free space, so uh, we, we just need the simplest set. Um, yeah. So, so uh, and then once he had these equations, he could solve them, and then he could show uh, that light was uh, made out of waves. And uh, when you ask most scientists uh, about the solutions of Maxwell's equations in free space, so when you have no charges and no currents, then then they will say, oh. The basic solutions of Maxwell's equations, they are plane traveling waves. You could also talk about sending waves, uh, depending on what kind of situation you have in mind and what you want to model, they, they are interchangeable. So, and then what we would say is that each one of these waves is characterized by some positive frequency and by a certain direction of propagation, but also an amplitude and polarization. So the electric field might point in this direction. Uh, or it could point in this direction, and, and that tells us the different polarization. The, the wavelengths gives us the, uh, so these waves, the properties of these waves, yeah, that uh, this is a wave that travels to the right. So, so these properties of these waves is what characterizes uh, the light. And if I have, if I take many of these frequencies, then I can, uh, Create a more general solution of Maxwell's equations, and that will be uh, that will give us a wave packet. Yeah. So when I add many, of, when I say I have photons of this type, of this type, of this type, and this type, so I look at the range of frequencies, and I put all these waves uh, together, then I can create. Yeah. So by adding different waves, I can create a wave packet that is then more compact, and then that moves uh, in a certain direction. Yeah. So in this way. I have a simple solution, more general solution. And all of these, the plane waves and the wave packets, they all obey uh, Maxwell's equations. So the problem we then have as quantum physicists is we want to make a quantum theory for those, this kind of description of light. This is a paper, for example, that we wrote in 2015, some years ago where we looked at the more physically motivated quantization of the electromagnetic field. So often people do things that are quite similar to how quantum mechanics is derived. We tried to take some shortcuts. Uh, what surprised us was that the, the paper got quite a lot of downloads at the end, which was nice. <laughs> and uh, Rob Bennett, who was uh, the, is the first author, he is now lecturer in Glasgow which is also really nice. And he wrote, of course, many other papers. So one of the, the problems is when you are a quantum physicist, 
is that in quantum physics, we know that everything we do is described by the Schrodinger equation. Yeah, so it has an equation IH bar. I won't show many equations, but this one I couldn't resist. So you have one type of equation, but now we already model life by another type of equation. And the difficulty is to find this symbol H in this equation that gives you exactly the same dynamics at, as what we had before. And uh, what Schrodinger did is in mechanics, so when he heard, uh, when he was sitting in a seminar about quantum physics, the, the story says, or the, the, the fairy tale goes, that he was listening to all this talk about waves and particles and being everything at the same time. He was saying that if if uh, things are waves, then they should be a wave equation. And this is essentially a wave equation that he wrote down. Of course, it th then still took a very long time to show uh, that this equation really describes everything really well from massive particles but the beauty of quantum mechanics is that you have one equation that describes everything it, it describes massive particles like atoms electrons uh, as well as light which is a massless particle and this symbol h always represents uh, the energy of these particles and uh, what we did in our paper and what many people did before is is to find this energy and to translate it in a more quantum mechanical lecture and then you can more or less do everything that Maxwell's equations do you can do with this one equation you can write down a wave packet what it looks like initially evolve it in time solve the equations and you will see that your wave packet uh, travels okay i have a bit of time left so i want to point out something that uh that uh yeah, some some more new results. Uh, if you have look long enough at Maxwell's equations, then what we find is, and what is also nice, uh, fits nice with what Schrödinger said, is that at the end, anything, anything that moves with uh, the speed of light, yeah, if you point have electric and magnetic fields in, let's say, if light travels, for example, along the x-axis, then these equations just look like that, where we have partial and temporal derivatives on one side and the other, but any electric and magnetic field that travels with the speed of light, if I point them in the right direction, uh, you can show that these solve Maxwell's equations. Yeah. So the E field is always C times the B field. Uh, and then you can check that this really obeys these very simple equations. So anything that is so the reason we think about light as waves often is because that's what we are used to. And also you think of light, photons as the waves that are coming out uh, when an atom loses its energy. But um, if it is much easier to describe things in position space. So if I have a broad wave packet, the dynamics is simply as time progresses, it moves more and more either in one direction or the other direction. And this is also one of the things we learned from uh, Einstein, at the end, light is something that is uh, always, yeah, just moving at a constant speed, and that's the speed of light. Yeah, and and it does that in any coordinate system. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is what uh, we were doing is we were looking at very highly localized wave packets. So one of the problems we have in quantum mechanics is, or in in, in general, if if uh, nature also allows for wave packets that are very localized and all of it moves with the speed of light and we move everything in the same direction, then uh, we, we have to have these type of objects. They also need to exist in any quantum theory. Yeah? And in order to create a wave packet that, uh, has, uh, that is so highly localized, I need to really use a superimpose all the frequencies that I have in, available. And what we have is we have to superpose positive and negative frequencies. So what has one of the things that has been overlooked when we introduce when we talk about quantum physics is that uh, only allowing for positive frequency solutions, we can create any wave packet or we cannot keep that wave packet together. If the positive K travel in one direction, negative K 
can go in the other direction, then every wave packet immediately spreads out uh, and uh, we run into problems. If we want to have our theory to also include wave packets that are very localized and that move with the speed of light in one direction, then we need to allow for positive and negative uh, frequencies. So what that means is that a lot of the current description that people use for modeling the electromagnetic field is actually not complete. What we need to have is we need to have photons that have a positive frequency and these need to be traveled positive to the left and to the right. But in order to compose them and put them together to also get highly localized wave packets, you also need photons with negative frequencies that travel to the left and to the right. So, and uh, when we map those on the, on the Schrodinger equation, then what we find is that uh, we are no longer, it's no longer enough to describe light by this equation. We need to also have a low or minus sign. And um, yeah, so, so there is, uh, I think what I'm saying is there's no end to it. There are always new things to be discovered. And uh, the, more, the closer you look, look in the tiny things that do not add up, they might uh, open the door to more complex theories and to a better understanding. It always needs to fit together with what is already there and has been found in the past. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot explain more, but <laughs> I'm still, uh, still already uh, covering quite a lot, taking a lot of your time. So let me make uh, some final remarks. So the, the way how we describe, look at light now in my group uh, and in, in also in other groups worldwide, we, we, are, we are seeing that uh, the electromagnetic field and light in quantum physics is made out of uh, photons, but there are a wide range of definitions that one can use. These can be monochromatic photons with one fixed frequency, so waves that are spread out everywhere. They can be made out of finite wave packets of a finite length, but we can also create really highly localized uh, wave packets. Uh, but then we need to take positive and negative frequencies into account. And uh, it will be interesting to see if we understand these negative frequencies better, what we can design with them. Yeah. So I think the, the important, <laughs> well, what I try to emphasize is that uh, really there is, uh, nature is so rich in phenomena, but it is worse to keep on looking for simpler and simpler and simpler hypothesis that create this, this uh, huge number of phenomena. That's what scientists do. And every time we find a simpler way of and improve our understanding of, uh, of these phenomena and, and see what's behind them, what's causing them, uh, we can create uh, new devices. And, um, and maybe in a few years time, we will have a completely new theory that we can add to the long list about different series about light. I would also like to thank uh, the people I've been working with over the last years. Uh, I mentioned already Robert Bennett and Tom Barlow. Uh, Luis is now in Warsaw. Nick just set up a startup company. Ben is working with, as a PhD student. And also uh, these three, Jake, Daniel, and Rob, uh, are currently working with me in Leeds. Um, the, the, Last year has been uh, not always fun. We spent a lot of time looking at the screen and uh, which sometimes had, has been communicating and discussing has made it sometimes quite difficult. Uh, but then it makes other, uh, has made other things possible and uh, it makes it possible for me to sit in my living room at night and to give a talk to all of you in Newcastle and uh, um, from so many di different places. So thanks a lot uh, for listening and uh, for joining me tonight for, for yeah, the talk about different ways uh, of seeing light. Thank you for your nice uh, presentation. So now it's a uh, time for uh, for questions. Uh, I can see one question. Uh, I can read, uh, would you be able to please explain again what you were saying about the different arrangements and how this linked to probabilities. 
I'm a little bit confused. Thank you. Uh, what do you mean for? Can you be a bit more specific with your question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, this is what I'm reading. Uh, can you please provide more details about this question? About. Um, yeah, so uh, would you be able to please explain again what you were saying about the different arrangements and how this linked to probabilities? Ah, so, so for example, in quantum physics, what we do is we describe uh, a wave packet as, yeah, we describe light often comes in terms of wave packets. So it's made out of waves, but uh, it has some local distribution. So uh, if you would have put a detector here, for example, there is then a certain probability of finding the photon here. Yeah, uh, but, but then this wave packet that forms a photon, maybe it's better to explain it with this. So if I have a wave uh, packet, depending on where I put my detector, it is more likely to find the photon or not. The reason that we talk about photons is that when I detect, when I use a single atom to detect, how much light I have there, it will, I will always, always measure the light in multiples of H bar omega, which is the transition frequency of the atom. Uh, but we we'll always find an integer number of photons. You can talk about something as light and as particles at the same time. But the only way of linking the two is, is by having things happening only with a certain probability. Yeah. So the um, because waves are kind of continuous, while well, a particle is something, yeah, you have it or yet you don't have it. Does that make more sense? Okay, thank you. So, any any other question? Well, if not, I can ask the, a question myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, who is uh, raising the hands? Any other question? No, no question. Okay, so if not, I can ask my question, question myself. We have one minute. So you commented about the different companies that are uh, trying to develop uh, new devices and so on. So I was wondering, from the point of view of the invisibility cloaking devices, is there any company working on this? So is there any application or or something? Um, let me see where it is. Uh, yeah, here. Um, I'm not sure. I guess uh, it's my guess would be that it's mainly the military that would be interested in it. I, I know they, they uh, there's a lot of uh, they use a lot of optical tools to make airplanes, for example, invisible <laughs> by scattering light of it. So, but I'm, I'm I'm not sure if it's working well enough yet to uh, to uh, have applications. But, but when I looked around uh, in the in the internet, it really uh, people were showing sheets and people were walking behind it and disappeared. Uh, you need to be close to the sheet. It seems there's a lot of progress happening. But I don't know about uh, companies about this. I'm, I'm yeah. I'm okay. in quantum optics, so, so I, I I know about the quantum uh, startup company, but not so much. But also, this has happened. There are so many things happening very quickly at the moment, so I'm not sure. Uh, okay. I don't know of everything, <laughs> but I think we are in for some surprises quite soon. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. So uh, okay, so uh, you don't have any any other question? Uh, well. Uh, uh, well, thank you first of, of all uh, to the to the speaker for for, for the nice uh, talk. Also, uh, I would like to uh, let you know that the next uh, talk uh, from the Northeast uh, uh, branch will be uh, Professor Christine uh, uh, Davis, and uh, with a presentation entitled "Solving the uh, Foundry of the Dark," uh, uh, the 27th of, of May. So, uh, well, that's that's all. So, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, at the end, uh, you will have a survey. Well, you, you can complete a survey, okay? That you will see uh, at the end of this uh, of this uh, session. So, uh, goodbye to everybody, and uh, and uh, good night. So, good night. Bye. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Cheers. Bye.